In a place that used to be a city, where fragments of civilization can barely be recognized, a man holds another down while huffing profusely. The guy with blue eyes and white hair notes that he knew it. He is much different than the other useless bastards he was with. The man tells him to shut it, but the guy urges him to do what he came here for. He should kill him, as he is the only one who can do it in the first place. But the man refuses, as he will not be the one who makes his hands red with his blood. He promised everyone on this team that he would put him on the chair, so justice is served as it should be. He will be punished according to the law. Now that he thinks about it, he still regrets this day, as he should have killed him when he had the chance. Later, the news reveals that the infamous villain, Sung Huan Huang, the person who made the entire world scared, has been captured and swiftly sentenced to death. To ensure maximum safety, a superpower suppression device has been placed on him, and he has also been imprisoned on the fifth basement floor of the Ruculus prison, famous for holding every villain at one point. Additionally, the mighty heroes who fought along Gong Yu Seo will be buried together, and their burial will be held tonight, to commemorate that their sacrifice was not for nothing. Gang Yu can barely look at them, even if they are on the TV. But as he looks, someone closes the TV behind him and says that he's still in recovery, so he shouldn't be watching TV. This is his brother, Gang Ho Seo, the Ruculus prison inspector. Seeing his brother, Gang Yu looks at his hands and a darkness envelops him, as he should have killed that bastard with his own two hands. Gang Ho says that he promised it to his teammates after all, there was nothing he could do. Before the attack, one of them said that heroes are heroes because they save people. It's not their duty to kill criminals. So on this mission, they will not kill anyone, even if they are a villain who has done terrible things, as criminals were once people too, so at least they shall stand trial. Gang Yu appreciated her little daydreaming, but what if they get killed? That's when she made him promise that even if they die, he shall not kill anyone, even if they deserve it. Gang Ho agrees with that same notion, as people should be sentenced to death by law only. However, correctional officers like him are the ones who have to carry out the sentences. He shouldn't tell him this, but Huang will be executed the next week, and he will also be there. He already did his job as a hero, the rest he can leave to the legal system. They should go and say his final goodbyes to his teammates. At the site where the heroes were buried, countless flowers and messages are placed, while everyone is screaming for the swift death of Huang. Gong Yu also went to place a single blue flower, but a week after this, on the day of Huang's execution, Gang Ho was killed. The killer who killed countless people in the name of a bygone ideology survived, yet his brother, who did everything for the law and was a dutiful man, died. As he sits down at Gang Ho's funeral place, a woman by the name of Se Yun Jo, the ruckulous prison warden, arrives and asks if he would like to talk for a minute. When he agrees, she hands him a video of what happened during Huang's execution. Reluctantly, he watches it. When they were all dragging Huang to his final moments, he recognized Gang Ho as Gang Yu's brother and also felt that he didn't have a single superpower. Is that why he's a prison guard? He also wondered which one of them was older, but Gang Ho didn't indulge him, until he asked how he feels when he takes someone's life. Since he is an executioner, he probably killed a lot of people, just like he did. So how does it feel? He will tell at first, that it feels pretty easy. Gang Ho asked how he can say that, but Huang was quite literal, because as soon as he scrapes someone with his finger, they go pop, in an explosion of viscera and blood. Gang Ho said that they are not the same, as he is ridden with extreme guilt whenever he has to kill someone, even monsters like him. Even though all he does is press one measly button, he still gets night terrors and can barely sleep anymore. Even if they are people who deserve it, the prisoners he executes live in his head rent-free and will haunt him until he dies. Huang asks why he's still working here if that's the case, but Gang Ho notes that someone has to. It's just a job at the end of the day. When the execution was about to commence, Gang Ho asked for Huang's last words. But he just asked who's older between him and his brother with a sick smile, prompting Gang Ho to start the execution. The reverse countdown started, and at one, the video cut off. Se Yun explains that right after the moment of execution, all of the power in the facility shut down, which was done by an unidentified imp strike, allowing Huang to escape. All of the correctional officers got down, and the eldest out of them called for backup over the radio, as the prisoner they were carrying has escaped. But as soon as Huang touched him, he started to convulse and grow blemishes, until like he said, he exploded, right in front of Gang Ho. Huang went up to him and said that he must be the elder brother, but he would like some confirmation. Gang Ho did not know what to do, so he did what his job entitled him to do, attack Huang. Naturally he didn't have a chance, as Huang just took his arm off, but he was still pressed about who's older between them, he must know. Even in his awful state, Gang Ho picked up his baton and charged in, as justice must be served, and monsters like him shall be killed. At that moment, Huang compressed him into a lump of flesh. Now, the EMP strike has set all of the prisoners on every floor free, meaning that they now control the prison entirely. 
They fortunately managed to stop them from breaking out, but many officers are still inside. Perhaps they are dead by now. Gang Yu asks who launched this EMP strike, but Se Yun doesn't know, as they are still looking into it. She apologizes for coming to his brother's funeral and daring to ask something of him, but can he suppress the riot at the prison? Gang Yu instantly agrees, but he has one little condition he wants met. His old teammates always told him that heroes save others, not kill them, and his brother, who was a correctional officer, said that people can only be sentenced by law and nobody else. The people who carry out these duties are the executioners, so he will not go inside this hell as a hero. He will enter the prison as what the prisoner fears most, the executioner. He introduces himself as their new corrections officer, but these guys know who he is. Why is a hero like him wearing that uniform? However, it doesn't really matter, as he will die just the same. The moment these prisoners charge him, he punches a tire-sized hole in the first one and sends the others flying as they are mangled by the air of the attack. He pulls up the microphone he has inside his suit and says that under the order of the government, everyone from the ground floor to all of the floors, including the fifth basement floor, shall be executed immediately. The prisoners are naturally mad that they are being executed, as they feel like they don't deserve it. Gang Yu says that they already took countless lives. Why are they getting so upset when their time comes? They all try to defend themselves. One named Kalita screams that he didn't kill that many. He murdered 12 people. Another named Brooks dismembered seven people, just because he felt like doing. Another one who goes by Keed has done heinous things against the young population of this country. They all scream and demand a lawyer, but one of them named Gu Wan Choi, who killed eight people, notices that this new guard is being distracted by the others, so he can swiftly get out with his ability. He tries to do just that, but the moment Gong Yu senses him, he literally kicks his head off, making the others fall silent. He will give him a simple choice. They either put their suppression devices back on and return to their cells and wait for their execution, or they can die right now by his hands. One of them tells him to stop talking nonsense. The latter is the much better choice. They are going to die anyway. Might as well fight while doing it right. The terms of his negotiation make zero sense. What kind of guard is he anyway? Gang Yu notes that he's misunderstanding something. This ain't no negotiation. This is the last chance for mercy that he is graciously offering them. The others begin talking, with the common consensus being that they should surrender. But that's when the guy who spoke earlier screams at everyone to listen with his power, which certainly does make them listen. Hero or not, there's just one of him. He cannot hope to deal with all of them at once. In fact, he managed to kill a second tier hero before, and teamwork was the secret to success. This gives the prisoners newfound confidence, and the man rallies them behind him. They should not feel intimidated by this bastard. They shall quickly deal with him and go out into the world once again. Gang Yu looks at this instigator and thinks that he must be the one that the warden told him about. At her office, Se Yun explained that the prisoners of Ruculus are grouped by their threat level. The ground floor holds over 300 killers, who have killed several people. The first basement floor holds about 100 or so criminals that put entire towns in danger. The second floor holds about 30 criminals, who put entire cities in danger. The third floor has 10 people that can make entire nations fall. The fourth basement floor holds only 5 people, which is a threat to the continent. And the fifth basement floor holds Huang and two others, who are dangerous to the entire world. She knows that this is a lot to ask, but fortunately, he will have to only face a number of them. Because these prisoners, at the end of the day, are still criminals. Whether on the second or fifth floor, they will certainly start killing each other, out of boredom or out of pure enjoyment. The only place where this is different is on the ground floor, as all of the prisoners in that place are united under one man, Hylison. He has a special superpower that can empower others around him. Gang Yu says that he attacked a hospital with 30 criminals to kill 7 people and a second tier hero named Hayes for a total of 8 people. Hillison says that he's wrong. It was actually 10 people since the hero woman was pregnant with twins. Hearing this, Gang Yu calls the warden and says that he may use a little force, so he wonders if this prison is sturdy enough. Se Yun gives him the go ahead, as it won't break no matter what. With this, Gang Yu knows to not hold back any punches. But Hillison believes that he's just bluffing, as he barely did a thing in that hero group he was in. Equality. He probably captured Huang by sacrificing everyone and getting the final blow. He shouldn't worry, however, as he will have a chance to apologize to them, since he will be sending him to them right now. He uses his ability to strengthen everyone around him, to the point that the surge of power rises to their heads, and they all charge Gang Yu at once. In an instant, with a single blow, he takes out the majority. Hillison's face drops as he sees this, but Gang Yu is not done yet as he pummels the ground so hard it sends everyone flying, and even makes the entire prison tremble. On the first basement floor, a man notices this rumbling, and wonders if that really is Gang Yu. Hillison screams at the top of his lungs, and tells the others to stop the approaching Gang Yu. But try as they might, he is unstoppable, 
and dashes through everyone with blinding speeds, cutting them in half before they can even realize it. They all fall to the ground like hail, and Gang Yu confirms that the ground floor has been completely executed. The next target will be the solitary confinement cell. As he does that, he wonders how many he killed already. Hundreds, perhaps. Each time he meets prisoners, he gives them the same warning. Put the devices back on, or die. One of the last dudes that tried to attack him had his head blown off like the others, while his buddy immediately surrendered and wanted to put the device back on. However, this was just a ruse, so he can surprise attack Gang Yu with a large explosion. He was ecstatic to land the hit, but Gong Yu wasn't even scraped by this weakling. Yet it reminded him of something. What a captured villain said to Tomai when she captured her. She pities the fool that has no physical type ability, as they cannot feel the ecstasy of crushing a person with their hands. Gang Yu did not feel any emotion from doing such brutal acts. It's like he's crushing eggs with his fists. Too easy. He eventually makes it to a large holding cell, where the man inside notes that he knew it was him who made all of this commotion. But how long has it been? About three years, right? This is Chuck Fielder, arrested and sentenced to die because of numerous accounts of cannibalism and desecration of corpses in general. He is glad to see that he found himself a new job, but he doesn't look that happy with it. Gang Yu gives his warning, but Chuck just says that he knew in his soul that they were going to meet again. He even remembers the first time they captured him. Does he remember when he saw the pot of delicious stew he prepared? And he urged him to take a bite, as he's not going to have something more succulent than human flesh. He can guarantee it. He was so mad that he tried to kill him, but that blonde gal he was with stopped him. He knew at the time that he was very mad at her decision. He thought that his teammates were a bunch of fools, right? Gang Yu has had enough of his yapping, and presumes that he chooses to die now. Chuck asks if he knows why he kills people, but Gang Yu couldn't care less, and cuts his head off. Even so, Chuck still speaks, and explains that he does it so that they remember him. Whenever he kills someone, he becomes the only person they ever think of at that moment. He can use his power to engrave the memory of his victims in their eyes, so that they will never forget him, even if they die. This is his superpower, hallucination. To prove his point, he says that he remembers every person he has killed, and will name them one by one. As soon as he tries to do that though, Gang Yu cuts his hand off, and says that this is why he was in solitary. He was actually aiming for that ugly mug of his, but it appears that his power isn't as omnipotent as he believes it is. Chuck just laughs, and wishes to ask something before he dies. Does he remember the people he killed on the way to this place? Gang Yu says that he doesn't since they are all worthless scum not worth remembering. With this in mind, Chuck uses his ability to make all of Gang Yu's dead teammates appear, as he truly wants to make him remember their meeting. Even after seeing them, Gang Yu cuts through his old friends like butter, and asks if that is everything he's got. Chuck can't believe how instantly he attacked his own people, but he does not see it that way. They are just hallucinations that mean nothing. Besides, he is no longer one of them. He is a corrections officer. In his last moments, Chuck says that he is not a guard. He is more akin to a monster. Not much different than Huang is. Even if he wouldn't admit it, this will certainly stick with Gang Yu. On the fifth basement level, Huang is extremely bored. As the woman he tried to kill won't fight back. And he can't touch her either. Since it has come to this, maybe he should just go up instead of waiting around here. On an unknown basement floor, a man asks one Miss Sinka when they are going to intervene, but she is more focused on Gang Yu, and exclaims that he will become her husband, no matter what. The guy next to her named Canis, notes that earlier, she said that Huang is going to be her husband. The girl, Gato, says that he's right. Didn't they fire the EMP strike to save Huang in the first place? Canis also says that the guy is a hero, so he's an obstacle for the progress of mankind. Sinka explains that he was a hero. He does not seem like one now, that's for sure. The two urge her to choose, as polygamy is illegal. She doesn't know who to choose, as they both have nice traits. But since it has come to this, the one who survives will become her man. Eventually, Seiyun appears in the prison, and congratulates Gang Yu for swiftly taking care of the ground floor. The prisoners will get more powerful the more he descends, so she suggests getting some rest. But he refuses, as he will head down right now. She understands, but has a favor to ask while he is still down there. They are still getting signals from some surviving correctional officers on the lower floors, so if he can, he should save them, so that they may return to their families. He asks how many officers are alive but they do not know, as the communication devices are all banged up, except on the fifth floor. It's as if someone wants them to see the atrocities committed there, no matter how gruesome they may be. The team confirms that they are ready to open the first basement floor, and the warden also authorized the procedure. Her last words to Gang Yu are that of warning, as he should be careful since the prisoners will certainly be stronger than before. The instant the heavy metal doors open, Gang Yu is struck from two sides by two buff criminals, while the others spam ranged attacks to make sure that they finish him off. Seiyun becomes startled and worried for Gang Yu, 
but someone comes from below and says that she should worry about her own problems, as she will have plenty soon enough. He cannot believe that he actually caught the warden, now he can wipe that smug grin on her face. He calls the others to brag about his catch, but they are all dead, and he is soon met with the same fate. Gang Yu warns the warden to not stay so close to an open door, it's not safe for her anymore. Before he leaves, she tells him one final thing, that Tomoki, the villain that Tomai captured, is on the level he's going to, but Gang Yu already knew. In a certain insulation cell on the first basement floor, the others hear the commotion and wonder if the others managed to get out, but Tomoki calls them a bunch of dumbasses. They didn't, as nobody can make that much noise with their attacks. Even if she told them to stay, they wouldn't listen. She has been sentenced to death because she killed 28 heroes, and an ex-hero, who is now mocking the others for ending up as villains. One of them gets mad at her and asks if she wants to die. Tomoki just laughs in his face. As they are all here for killing civilians, they have probably never even damaged heroes with abilities, and he dares to say that he can fight with her? Is he that dumb? The man has had enough and says that he will kill one himself right now to see how it feels. But Tomoki doesn't even let him transform fully, as she instantly cuts him in half and asks if he got what he wanted out of this. She captured countless villains as a hero and learned how to fight against people who have these superpowers. She used that to kill a bunch of heroes too, so they should all join forces with her, as she can guide them on how to hunt these heroes like dogs. And as a bonus for joining, she will tell them about Gong Yu's abilities. The others who don't wish to challenge her ask how she knows of Gong Yu's abilities, but she notes once again that she was a hero once too, so she knows many things about most of the heroes. One of them wonders if that will even make a difference, as he was a part of equality before, which means that he is a first-tier hero, unlike she is, she's third-tier at best. Tomoki just laughs, and explains that after Ryosa became leader of that group, she started to reform the entire hero industry. The first thing she did was refining what it meant to be a hero, and banned everyone from killing villains, no matter what. She also initiated a training program that made multiple heroes train at once. And lastly, but most importantly, she completely abolished the tiering system, which ranked heroes before. They may wonder why she's telling them all of this history, but the tier system was taken down before Gang Yu joined the team. Nobody saw him joining that group, because he didn't have many achievements to speak of, so naturally rumors started flowing. Some said that he had powerful connections, and others presumed that Ryosa is his lover. The man agrees that something's strange, as he has never seen Gong Yu fight, but he did wipe out the ground floor in a matter of seconds, meaning that he's at least a second tier hero. They cannot fight someone like that, right? Tomoki tells him to stop being such a scaredy cat. The ground floor was full of weak bastards. Even everyone in this room, with their thousands of people killed, could have taken them out, including Speech, who has murdered 6,435 people. She isn't calling Ganyu weak, far from it, but she knows what his weakness is, which is why she thinks that they can hunt him down easily. Speech asks if she's sure that what she knows is really his weakness. Tomoki tells them to stop being so indecisive, as they don't have much of a choice anyway. Either they join her, or meet him alone. Seeing the situation, most of them decide to join her, and Speech also agrees, although he's quite reluctant. Superpowers were first discovered in humans several centuries ago, and over the years, Researchers took it upon themselves to study this phenomenon and grouped abilities into three categories as a result. The first are physical type superpowers, which strengthen or modify the user's body. The second is creation type superpowers, the ability to create materialistic things out of thin air. And third are the special type superpowers, all other powers who do not fall in the first and second abilities. All of the prisoners stand in front of their cells while Gang Yu arrives and Speech uses his brainwave communication ability to connect everyone to the same waves, allowing them to see Gong Yu from everywhere. And Tomoki thinks that he has physical type superpowers, just like she does. She thinks that she knows of his weakness, because she saw him train once when she was still a hero. He was against a robot, who immediately went to blast him. Gang Yu once again tells them to put their devices on or die, but that's when a blast hits him, which he doesn't even try to dodge. This is his weakness, he refuses to dodge any attack. That is why Tomoki cleverly placed prisoners with creation and special type abilities behind the cells to blast attacks on him. She also knew why he refused to dodge the attacks, because he simply did not need to. But this is precisely why she added something to that barrage of attacks, as Gong Yu is suddenly coiled by countless suppression devices. Before this whole thing happened, she sent everyone to search the bodies of the guards and find the suppression devices. But Speech wondered if they would work on him, since these are only the first basement floor level. She said that it's fine. They just need a bunch of them to suppress him, 10 if he's a second tier, and 15 if he's a first tier, even though that is unlikely. She ordered Million, who can make any item lock on any target, to hold them and prepare to strike him. But just because she wants to be safe, they should put 30 devices on him, 
that will do the job. The others start to celebrate, but soon, their faces crumble into frowns, as the flaws in Tomoki's plan start to become visible. The first flaw was that Gang Yu is far more powerful than any first-tier hero. Speech confirms that he broke all the suppression devices, which confuses Tomoki. But the others scream at her to tell them about the next phase. Do they start it? She tells everyone to begin the second phase, which is to hold a few guards at power point and warn him to not get closer, as these innocent guys will die. When they are done talking, the second flaw in Tomoki's plan appears. She thought that Gang Yu only had a physical ability. The others die in pain and anguish, because they were not told he had these kinds of abilities. As the others come out of their cells and try to surrender, the third and biggest flaw in her plan appears. She thought that she could win against somebody who outclasses her in every aspect. Eventually, Speech has nobody to connect to with his ability and starts screaming at Tomoki. Everyone was wiped out. What the fuck are they going to do now? He continues to scream at her while she wonders what to do, asking her to say something at least. But this was his fault in the first place. He shouldn't have trusted someone who used to be a hero. Tomoki has had enough of his constant screaming and stabs him out of rage, multiple times in fact, while screaming at him to shut the hell up. She still wonders how he got past those suppression devices. Does that mean he's just that strong? That's when she notices that a guard is in the room with her, and since she wants an outlet to let her rage out on, she chooses to maim him with her claw. But before she can, Gang Yu cuts her hand off. He asks if she has any last words before her execution, but she just says that she's screwed. Gang Yu asks if those are her last words, but she asks if it's true that all of the heroes in Equality are dead. Gang Yu confirms it, meaning that Tomai is dead too. She can't believe that she's gone. She told her not to become a hero, but her foolish little sister did not listen. She also can't understand why he's killing people when he's a part of equality. Do the other heroes know about his actions? Ryosa desperately tried to change the hero industry, but by doing this, he ruined everything she worked for. She's probably looking at him in shame now. Gang Yu does not let out a sliver of emotion and asks if she's done yapping. When Tomoki joined the hero industry, the first thing she thought was that something was seriously wrong with it. Back then, the simple fact that the heroes were fighting villains allowed them to kill the villains, but they were also granted immunity should civilians die in the process, meaning that heroes were above the law. She became a heroine named Bliss for one simple reason, because of her sister Tomi, who admired her a lot. Unlike Tomoki though, Tomai didn't have superpowers at the time, so she always got help from Tomoki. However, nothing twisted Tomoki or made her into the villain she is today, as she was twisted from the start. As a hero, she had the job of saving people, but she did not do it out of kindness or to maintain peace. She did it because she felt superior above everyone. But one eventful day, she had to kill a villain on one of her rescue missions. It was the first time she killed someone, and it made her feel over the moon. It took her higher than any drug ever could, as she felt extremely superior and ecstatic. After this, she could not stop herself and started killing everyone, be it villains, civilians, or heroes. In particular, her favorite prey was her colleagues who were weaker than her as the looks they gave her after they lost, betrayal mixed with fear and terror, and the final cherry on top, them begging for their lives. She could not get enough of it, but soon, things would change. Tomai thought it was quite strange that Tomoki was always late, and she also sensed a heavy scent of blood around her, so she decided to follow her, and that's when she witnessed her sister's actions. Tomoki wasn't that surprised that she saw her, instead she invited her to join the fun, but if she does not, she will keep enjoying the fruits of murder. That is when she was chained up for the first time, and also when Tomai unlocked her powers, and stopping Tomoki was the whole purpose of her heroine career. After this, she officially registered as such and hunted her sister down as a villain, until one day she managed to catch her. Tomoki wasn't that sad though, she just told her that it's sad she doesn't have a physical type ability, as she will not enjoy the succulent feeling of crushing someone's head with her own two hands, how much ecstasy can be felt from it. At that moment, Tomai denounced Tomoki as her sister, and sent her to prison. She asks how she died. Did she go in peace at least? Gang Yu tries to remember, and eventually does. She died in pain, while calling out for Tomoki to save her. She feels like she shouldn't have asked, but enough talking, it's time for them to settle the score. She immediately charges Gang Yu, who was actually a clone of himself. The real Gang Yu appears behind Tomoki, and smashes her with his leg before she can do anything. She does not give up however, as she comes jumping out of the dust cloud that was made from her impact, but Gang Yu just hits her in the gut, causing her to fully detransform. It saddens him that he has to kill a teammate's family, even if she is a death row inmate, but justice must be served. With those words in mind, Tomoki starts begging for her life, as he's a hero, who promised Ryosa not to kill no matter what. Gang Yu says that he's no longer a hero, but she still begs, and begs. Gang Yu tells her that she looks exactly like her victims, who asked her for mercy over and over, but she did not listen. Perhaps she did not even hear them. 
Thus ends Tomoki's life. The hero turned into a villain. The sound of Gong Yu fighting causes tremors throughout the prison, and the sounds made one fall in love even more, made another fearful for her life, and gave a little someone something to look forward to. Huang has had enough of waiting and decides to go up and meet Gang Yu sooner, but he is sent flying into the wall as soon as he says that, by none other than the third prisoner, Kingston. Huang notes that he's quite scary, but Kingston says that at his age, he can hardly be called that. He is also the first prisoner on the fifth basement floor, and the first prisoner ever. The warden is shortly informed that Kingston and Huang have met, which she was waiting for, as this means that one of them will certainly die. And personally, she's betting on Kingston to win, as he's not as threatening as Huang. But why is he keeping that woman in the air like that? Huang doesn't really want to play with an old man, but Kingston will certainly like to play with him. He is the first criminal to be locked up here, and he is also the longest serving inmate, even if he's on death row. Unlike most inmates in the basement levels, who were imprisoned for killing millions, Kingston only killed three people. The first victim was Caracas, the most powerful villain of his time, and the two other victims were Clark and Hilo, the most powerful heroes of the time. He appeared out of nowhere and killed the three most powerful people in the entire world. Everyone said that they were invincible, and since he killed them, this makes him the strongest person in the world, right? Truly disappointing. After this, he let the government capture him. Even though he was the biggest threat the world has ever seen, he voluntarily went to prison. Since the government and Hero Association were not on good terms at the time, and even now he was able to defer execution for 30 whole years. He promises Huang not to kill him. All he wants is to play a little, that's all. Reluctantly, Huang agrees, and pulls out some guards that he crushes into compact meatballs and throws them at Kingston, who uses hand movements to deflect the numerous balls and crush some under his might, creating rain of blood around the area. At first he thought that he was a user of telekinesis, but the way he attacks and defends tells him that he's different. Does he have anything else to show him? Huang says that he changed his mind. He isn't having any fun. What's the point of killing somebody who will die of old age? Kingston notes that he's quite arrogant, but he has seen numerous people like him, who think that they are the biggest fish in their small pond. Most of the time, their egos get the best of them. The entire building shakes as Kingston steps forward, with one of the guards thinking that the building is falling. But the warden tells him that the prison has 20 layers of special wall that can withstand any power. It will never fall. Kingston feels that it's his duty to teach the younglings, so he will show him that he can be humble too. In that moment, he charges in with a flying kick that goes through the wall and everyone feels it. The warden gets up from the ground and asks who won the fight, but the guard notes that they have bigger problems, as that single attack destroyed the walls, meaning that they are very screwed. Huang is surprised to see that someone so old could do something like this, but that's when someone from behind asks why he would follow an old man anywhere. This mysterious figure is Sinka who urges him to come and talk with her. Huang gets serious and asks who she is, but she will only say if he sits down and talks. The warden is extremely confused. How did that woman get to the fifth basement level? Sarika says that they will talk, but the spectators have to go. With that, she just closes the cameras, making the warden very mad. Gang Yu arrives at the second basement floor gate, but when he tries to get confirmation to go in, the signal cuts out. So he decides to just pull the gates open and go inside this way. As he walked down the stairs to the second basement floor, he did not feel the stench of blood, like on the other floors, something that was very strange. In fact, there was nobody there, not a single corpse, and it was clean too. That's when he notices someone running away from two beastly wolves that seem more like monsters than anything. The woman sees him too and thinks that he's Gang Ho, but she trips, allowing the beast to charge in. Naturally, Gang Yu kills them and asks if she's alright, but she just goes to hug him and says that he was supposed to be on the fifth basement floor. What is he doing here? And how did he get superpowers? Gang Yu grabs her and says that he is not Gang Ho. He is his brother. She knows about him, as he is a hero. But why is he wearing that uniform? And why is he here? Gang Yu notes that it's not safe here, so she should go up as everything is clear. She apologizes for acting like that, calling him brother-in-law. She knows that this sounds strange, since she has not introduced herself, so she will now. She is going to become his sister-in-law, and if she might add, they really look alike for brothers. In the isolation cell of this level, Miel tells Mael that there's an intruder in their midst, so he wonders how many sins he has committed in his life. Mael notes that he killed one of her innocent little puppies, so it becomes clear to Miel that he will be going to hell. The woman who goes by Jia Hong says that she has only seen him in videos and pictures, but he looks nicer in real life. Gang Yu notes that his brother told him about his girlfriend, but he didn't say anything about getting married yet. She notes that it was a rush job, as she found out that she was pregnant pretty recently, and that his niece or nephew is currently inside of her. Gang Yu is extremely shocked to hear this, and she says that it's hardly been a month, they only found out a few days out, 
and Gang Ho said that he will tell him after he is done with Huang. Gang Yu's face becomes ridden with sadness. He does not know if he has the strength to tell her. She asks why he's here in a uniform, and so he explains that he was commissioned to execute all of the prisoners in Rukulis, which she is surprised by. Did the warden make him do it or something? Gang Yu notices she doesn't know what happened, so he fills her in about the EMP strike, though they do not know who did it. She asks what happened to Gang Ho, as he was on the fifth basement floor. Gang Yu tries his best to tell her the truth, but given the circumstances, he chooses to lie and says that he's still sending rescue signals. She is relieved to hear that, and Gang Yu tells her to go up, since it's not safe. She wants to stay, however, as she can make it easier for him to go down, since she has the ability to, psychometry, which allows her to go through people's memories. Naturally, she would never do that to him if there was no good reason for it, but she used it before to find out about the inmates, and if they were really guilty. Gang Yu asks how this ability will help him, so she explains that this entire floor is under the control of Miel and Mael, the inmates that were put in the isolation cell. They are siblings that have summoning special type superpowers. What they summon is a creature that stabs people in the heart. Then they use their ability to make puppets out of these victims. And currently, every single prisoner has become their puppet. Gang Yu already knew that, because they are Mago's disciples. He does not need any information, so she should go already. She refuses again, as some of the combatants puppets the siblings control are correctional officers. He will not be able to distinguish between them since they are all puppets. But she can, as she can go through their memories. Gang Yu asks if they aren't dead already since they are puppets, but she promises that they are still alive. They will be themselves once they are released of the power. Gang Yu notes that they are dangerous criminals who will not listen to her, but this dumbass woman believes she can still persuade them. In a last ditch effort, Gang Yu tells her to think about the baby, but even if she's expecting, she is still a corrections officer, and she must serve the country as such. This reminds Gang Yu of his brother, so he agrees, but he envelops her with his power, to keep her from harm. She just hopes that this won't affect her body, as it feels weird. Eventually they meet some soldiers, who were made by Meal it seems. Hong tells him that most of the officers were captured by Meal. He's the older brother, so he should keep it in mind. Gang Yu asks which ones are the officers, and so she uses her ability, and finds out that there's only two here, the ones in the back. She tries to give him advice on how to do it, but Gang Yu just envelops her in more power till she cannot see, as there is an easier way to spare the officers. He envelops them in his binds and starts killing the inmates, as this is what he was sent for. As he does this with ease, the siblings watch him from a crystal ball. Mael wonders if he's stronger than their master, but Miel doesn't know, making Mael ask if he's stronger than that woman. She goes next to him and says that she's scared, but Miel tells her to cast away her worries, as he will not be able to kill them easily. After he is done with the soldiers, he lets Hong see again, and she asks why he did something like that. He apologizes, as he should have told her in advance, but he did what he had to do as a correctional officer, execute the inmates. She wonders how he did something like that, since the execution devices are on sub-level 5, but he says that he did it with his own two hands, making her ask whose idea it was to do something like this. Gang Yu confirms that it was his, and Hong asks if the warden really agreed with this. He said that he did, which makes her frown and wonder what that hag was thinking. She also asks if he's okay with something like this, which he is, as he's a correctional officer. It's his duty after all. She doesn't agree with this notion, as correctional officers aren't here to kill prisoners. They are here to rehabilitate them. That's their duty. Gang Yu doesn't care about that notion, and doesn't need any more sermons about ideals, especially from her. Even if heroes are supposed to save people, and not kill them, he knows all too well what happens when one pursues nothing but blind ideals. One day, they will be slaughtered by a monster who doesn't listen to reason. And if he's honest, he doesn't care if he's a hero or whatever the fuck. He should have done something like this a long time ago. Someone has to do it, and he is more than happy to. Hong tries to reason with him, saying that they are humans, but he wonders if she really is serious about this. Does she even know what she's talking about anymore? What makes her think that the people in here are humans, each of them in sub-level 2 and below killed thousands? They all deserve death, be it swift or slow. In the past, he recognizes that there were talks of abolishing the death penalty, because it was considered inhumane, but nobody has been wrongly convicted, ever. Since people with psychometric powers, they now know how many people were killed, and why, so she should think about her role in all of this. In her delusion, she still feels that they have a story to tell, especially the two they are going to. However, Gong Yu tells her that everyone has a story, including their victims. Besides, it makes no difference, they will end up dead anyway, whether they die by his hands or execution. She feels that it's wrong for a single individual to decide that and do it. Gang Yu doesn't care anymore, and tells her to shut it. If she keeps saying stuff like that, she will be sent upstairs by force, and he will handle the situation how he knows best. 
With that, she shuts up, and eventually they get to an area with some dark soldiers. He asks how many officers are there, and Hong tells him that the three in the back are three in the back. Before he charges in, she says that Gang Ho will be quite sad when he finds out what he did. This pushes Gang Yu over the limit, and he doesn't even try to dodge the incoming attack, as he is filled with rage. All of this fucking idealistic talk, it brings him bitter rage. Talk and talk and some more talk, like they know what it takes to do something like this. Even in this state, Gang Yu managed to calm down by killing the five prisoners. Sinka watches him and says that he keeps getting more awesome the more he descends. Gong Yu and Hong continue to walk until they meet another group, and when Hong tells him where the soldiers are, he tries to swiftly get to it. But that's when Miel and Mael come out, welcoming him inside. He is quite glad that he saved the trouble of searching for them. They ask Hong why she didn't come with them, as she would have gone to heaven. But Gong Yu tells them to release the mind control they have on the people. He promises them a swift death if they do that. Miel asks if he can just not kill them, but he explains that the prisoners on the ground floor and first sublevel were given a choice to die or put their devices back on, but everyone on sublevel 2 and below has killed thousands without even thinking they deserve death. Miel notes that he heard he used to work with their master and the woman who captured them, but he is much different than the two. Miel says that he will surely go to hell, but Gang Yu wonders who will end up there first between them. Miel says that if he promises to let them go, they will release their people, but Gang Yu instantly denies it. Hong tells them to not make things any worse and put the devices back on quickly. But Miel believes that they did nothing to deserve the death penalty. She must know that, right? That is why they refuse. Gong Yu tells her that beasts cannot be persuaded, no matter how much she tries. But there are ways for them to understand, especially pain. Oh, do they understand pain? Miel notes that he doesn't wish to fight him. He should hear their story, as then he will certainly negotiate. Gang Yu denies this and engulfs Hong in his power, as he has had enough of her idealistic yapping. He also grabs the siblings and says that once, a villain told him how to accurately torture people, to think that it would come in handy today. Miel says that he cannot be reasoned with, he is the beast in this matter. But Mael notes that he's much more, he's a monster. They suddenly switch places with some prisoners, telling Gang Yu that they have special type powers. Pretty annoying, but he also wonders why these beasts are calling him a monster all of a sudden. As he kills the soldiers that approach him, he says that it's quite disturbing. Mael watches this from a glass ball, while Miel desperately tries to cut down the wall next to them. She promises to slow him down however much she can. With that, she summons a large circle that makes tons of demonic-looking beasts come out right in front of Gang Yu. He is glad that for once he has to fight something which isn't human and swiftly goes through them like Swiss cheese. Mael knows that he's approaching fast and asks Miel how long it's going to take, but he will need 10 more minutes to finish, which makes her bite her finger and attempt to summon something. But in that moment, Gang Yu smashes through the door. After all, he gave it some thought and realized the rest will stop once he captures them. There is no point in fighting, so this is their last chance. Either they release the prisoners and receive a swift death, or they will die under brutal torture. He asks them once again to release their power, but instead Miel summons a fake imitation of holy angels, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and even Uriel. They do not live long, however, as Gang Yu instantly cuts them down, which makes Miel pick up some officers and demand he stay back. Or does he want to also hurt the prisoners? Gang Yu notes that if he does not let them go, his sister will suffer a terrible fate. He puts pressure on her, making her scream out in pain, and as her little bones crunch, Miel relents and says that he will withdraw his powers, but he must speak with Hong first. Gang Yu demands he releases his powers first, he will not stop until he does. With that he does, and everyone captured by the power is now free, including the prisoners, who are instantly cut in half. The officer wonders what happened, but he tells them to go upstairs already. Miel asks to keep his end of the deal, which Gang Yu agrees to, but they will go somewhere else for it as he doesn't want to make a pregnant woman see something like this. She is eventually allowed to see again, and Gong Yu says that it's over now. The people were released from the grip of the ability, and there are two criminals who wanted to talk with her before their execution. She asks to put suppression devices on them and leave it at that, but Gang Yu will not repeat himself anymore. These fuckers killed thousands, and he will finish them off even if he kills him. Miel notes that they did nothing to deserve the death penalty, so he asks her to say something. Hong really tried to say something, but what they did? she could not defend them against, meaning that Gang Yu was right, and since he kept his promise, it's time for them to die. Mael starts to go into shock while screaming, but it won't save her from the vengeful hand of justice. However, Mago will, as he casts a protective barrier over them, wonder what is going on around here. Gang Yu wonders if this is the ability of the twins, but he knows that no criminal can cast a defensive barrier like this. So Mago used that ability, but why? Why cast this type of magic on criminals? It doesn't really matter though as nothing will stop him from executing these murderers. 
As he breaks the barrier, however, Mago puts another in front of him, and another after he breaks that one. Gung Yu continued to destroy the barriers, but he kept feeling uneasiness throughout. He remembers when they were all at a park and Mago was greeting some kids. One of them wonders why he's not tired at all, while the other notes that it's great. The first one told Tomai that they will definitely have children when they get married, but she said that she doesn't date old timers. Mago invited them to come down, which they did, but Gang Yu sat next to them under the shade of a tree, until Mago appeared and asked if he doesn't like children. Gang Yu noted that it's not that, he just doesn't know how to interact with them. Mago told him that he can do what his parents did, but Gang Yu told him that his parents died after he was born. The only family he has is his older brother. Mago knows he kind of fucked up by brining it up so he apologizes, and after a short moment of awkward silence he notes that he can do it with him, act like a child that is. Naturally he was kidding, but it wasn't entirely a joke, as if things get tough for him, he can always come to him and talk about it. This also brings him to the darkest pits of his mind, where his teammates all died, and he was the only one standing. In his final moments, Mago told him that it's alright, and tried to comfort him, something that stuck with him, and when only one barrier was left, Gang Yu stopped. He drags Hong out of her bubel and asks if she can read the memories of abilities, which she confirms. So Gang Yu tells her to do this, and read the memories of that thing. When she does, she pulls out a memory of Mago, which Gang Yu finds is unpleasant. But why are the memories of those two murderers next to him? She says that, because this ability was cast on them, he didn't display them on purpose. Gang Yu notes that this doesn't mean he wants to spare them. He will kill them, no matter what happens. With that in mind, Hong lets him see their memories. He sees an auction, filled with the scent of despair and greed. Miel and Mael were also there, when they were six years old, and sold as slaves. The Ability User Auction is an underworld occasion below a fallen city, that was opened solely for VIPs that like to collect rare abilities as a mere hobby. Miel and Mael were both sold by their father at these auctions. Among the countless popular abilities that are bought, the special types are the most sought after, as are those who have the physical type, and transform their bodies. The summoning type is one of the most common among ability users, so they were both quite cheap, though that was just a ruse. They never revealed their special type abilities, making them stay locked up in a dark cell for a long time. Just as they were preparing to get written off as unsold goods, a woman came up with the proposition to buy them, because she was very curious about their abilities. The auctioneer asks if there's another reason for buying these two, as they are kind of useless. He was only asking because there is no way to refund her purchase afterwards. The woman explained that she was curious about something, more specifically what would happen if an angel mixed with a demon. Mael and Miel didn't understand her, which the woman didn't expect them to, but they will soon find out. Suddenly, an explosion large enough to encapsulate the entire area covered them, though they were only safe because of a familiar green spell cast on them. Naturally, the siblings were also safe, and Mago was the one who did all of this. Lipus, Mago's assistant who had no reason to dress like that, asks what he's even trying to teach her here. To blow people up? Mago laughed, and said that if she worked hard, she would be able to one day do the same, and she shouldn't forget that imagination is the most important thing in a summoning type. He also asked if she finished the task he handed over to her, which she confirmed. All of the people who participated in the auction were taken away, and the ones captured were freed. Mago suggested they go for another class, which Lipus didn't like, as she doesn't really believe summoning meteors is really that informative. That's when Miel grabbed their attention, and asked if they could come too. He also explained that they are summoning types, just like he is. Lupus told them that Mago promised to have only one apprentice, but he doesn't remember saying that in the past, so he asked to see their abilities. Miel and Mael did as they were told, and summoned an angel and a demon respectively. Lupus thought they were strange, as kids with summoning abilities like to spawn toys and su. Mago became interested in them, so he decided to take them under his wing. For three years, Mago taught the siblings how to use their summoning abilities efficiently. He explained that imagination is the key to a powerful summoning ability. The image that they have in their mind would naturally appear via their ability. It seemed like Miel summons angels because he was influenced by his caring mother, who has protected everyone ever since they were young, and Mael summons demons because she remembers their abusive father, who would get angry at anything. If they are able to broaden their perspective on the world, they will be able to summon even more things, though it's fine to be interested in only one thing too. He gave Lipus as an example, who only cared about meteors. Mago asked what direction they wanted to go, and Mael said that they were interested in heaven and hell. Their mother told them something before she passed away. Kind people go to heaven, and evil people go to hell. Those words are what they have been holding on to even in the darkest times. They both want to make this world right, into one where kind people get what they deserve and go to heaven, and sinners rot in hell. Mago just patted their heads and noted that if it's them, he is sure that they would be able to do anything they imagine. 
One eventful day, Lepus came with some bad news. The Hero Association requested his aid, which he didn't even care to hear, as they ignored his request earlier. That's when Lepus said that a Swede appeared in Finland, which shocked him, and he said that they must gather all members of equality, though they couldn't find them. With nothing else left to do, he wanted to see Miel and Mael one final time. He told them that he was leaving, with Mael taking it the worst, but Miel wondered when he would come back. Mago, with a sad expression, told them that it would be a few years, since their opponent is very tough and dangerous. Mael asked if they could go with him, but Mago refused, as the opponent was far too vile to even consider something like this. Mael began to break down, as she didn't want him to go, and she didn't want to be thrown away again. Lipus told them that they would never be thrown away since they are not objects, but to ease their pain, Mago gave them one last gift. He summoned the clothes they are wearing even now, and said that with these, he will always be with them, no matter what. He advised them to go to a shelter and have people help them, as they would surely meet again someday. Some people may put the blame on Mago for what happened next, as Miel and Maele didn't go to a shelter out of fear of people, instead choosing to isolate themselves in a remote mountain and strengthen their abilities. In that remote place, where they only had each other, they wondered what kind of abilities they would have, so that they could grow up kind, until they met Mago again. What is good, and what is evil? Most importantly, they pondered what they should do with their God-given abilities. Two years later, they finally decided on what was good and evil without anyone else's involvement. With that, they went back to their hometown, and kept the same ideology. Good people will see heaven, and bad people will suffer in hell. They started to create their own system of heaven and hell, judging people based on menial things. They are the rightful targets of execution after all. Within a month, they turned the whole town into their own place. They did this by summoning angels and demons who monitored the people of this town for a straight month and categorized them into two groups, heaven and hell. The standards that they had gone for were what their mother told them not to do when they were young, to not steal, not throw rubbish anywhere, to be quiet in places, not lie, not bicker, and so on. They were too young, and those ideals were too simple and childlike for any person. That is why they were scary, because in their eyes, they were not doing anything wrong, and they either liberated or damned people as they saw fit. Those who they deemed fit for heaven were made to dream a happy dream forever, even though it was a complete lie. News of what happened eventually reached the people of the Hero Association, and Yutaridi, the chairman of the association, was at the forefront of a meeting about them. There were only four people present at this meeting, including him. Tisu Banjo, a third-tier hero, said that everyone is probably on holiday, and Husta, another third-tier hero, wanted to get this over with, as he wants to see if he can find more interesting cases. After searching for a while, Husta only found level B1 cases, nobody would pay attention to these at all. Banjo was also sad, as she wanted to increase her tier, but she has to deal with B2 cases for that. Yutaridi said that there's a B3 if she wants it, but she said that doing something difficult isn't efficient. But she also wondered why this village takeover case was appearing here at all. Yutaridi explained that the children are categorized as B1 villains, so he decided to put them in. Husta asked how old they are, and he said about 10 years old give or take. Husta was shocked. They aren't even teenagers, yet they occupied an entire village? Bajo thought that if they are like this now, they will probably end up being B2 or B3 villains. Husta suggested they take them in and raise them, but Utoriti noted they don't have the resources for it, and it would take too long. Additionally, they are already apprentices of Mago, or at least they were. Bansho told them that if Mago raised them, it was his problem, but Husta informed her that he was in Finland dealing with Aswede. That's when the third member perked up and asked if she could go. This is Chitu, a third tier hero, and a summoner at that. When she finally got to the town, she saw quite a sight while on a road nearby, as countless people were floating in the air. Mael and Miel instantly got their eyes on her, but she just started taking pictures with the various soldiers while wondering what kind of ability this is, as these guys don't look all that dead. Suddenly the siblings appeared before her and asked why she had come here. Chithu was pleasantly surprised to see that they are in the special category, as she always wants to see all of their abilities, and asked if they had any more. Miel wanted his question answered, but instead Chithu wondered if Mago knew that they were a special category. From what she knew, he only took in summoners as apprentices. That's when she realized that they didn't tell him at all, and Miel asked who she was. She removed her mask and said that she was their senior, Chithu. Miel noted that Mago never told them about her, which she was expecting. They never agreed eye to eye, so to speak. She was always interested in sharp things. Mago adamantly suggested that she should train her defense magic along with her offensive one, but defense isn't her thing, so she refused to listen. After that decision, slowly but surely, he stopped looking in her direction. He is way too mean. She started to cry out and scream about how mean he is again and again, making Mael scared of her. 
Even when he told her how talented she was, he did it with a smile, yet he completely erased her from his mind. Miel threatened her with magic and told her to go away, but instead, Chitu summoned countless blades and started to impale everyone in her way, including civilians. Surely if she does something like this, Mago will remember her. Mago turning out to be the villain of this series. Good lord. Kithu laughed like a maniac while slashing countless innocent people and felt a sense of euphoria like never before. The two siblings checked on each other and wondered what to do next. Kithu skipped around the bodies she laid on the ground and said that this was much more fun than she could imagine, though now she wanted more. As she threw one of her blades at another person, however, the siblings appeared and protected them, which made Chitu happy as they really got their defensive magic down. A guard tried to attack from behind, but she was too swift and told the siblings that they needed to work on their attacks. Mael said that she will definitely end up in hell, which made Chitu sad, as he is their senior, so she feels that some respect is in order. If she is honest though, she always wanted to use her ability on a bunch of people at once, but if she did that normally, she would end up in jail quite fast even if she is a hero. However, they both presented her with a golden opportunity and fulfilled her lifelong wish. With all of this, she felt that she could do it. She could finally summon what she always wanted. She started to scream out loud as she used all over power and eventually summoned a razor blade, even though she was bleeding from her face. The power of imagination is the most vital thing for a summoner. And since Chitu felt an experience like never before from killing countless people, her imagination sparked up and strengthened her ability. She was amazed at herself as she never expected to be able to summon such a large thing and thank the siblings from the bottom of her heart. Though now, it was time for them to die. That's when a large demon ate her whole, as she was not the only one who felt an overwhelming emotion. Mael saw Chithu as a real demon and her ability was thus strengthened. She turned to Miel and wondered if she really killed a person. In response, he hugged her tightly and said that what she slayed was not human, never was. One year later, the siblings expanded their influence over a larger area and with this, they both rose to be B2 villains of Ruculus Prison. Mago was shocked when he saw them in the database, with Utoriti knowing that they were his apprentices, so he wanted to show him at least. Magu got up to go, but Utoriti refused to allow him. This case will be assigned to someone else. Magu asked why he would do that, and Utoriti said it was quite simple. He humbly requested that he kill Aswede when he finally got him, but instead he chose to hand him over to the government, so there is no reason for him to let him do what he wants anymore. Mago didn't take no for an answer, and said that he would go no matter what. Utoriti slammed the table and said that he will not and cannot go. He commands him. Mago told him to shut it, as he was always obsessed with authority. That's when someone volunteered to go, that someone being Raosa. Utoriti didn't mind it, as this is a perfect promotion mission for her. Mago still held his own, but Raosa approached him and asked this defeated man to trust her, at least once. Inside the cleansed city, the siblings instantly knew that an intruder had appeared, and Mael wondered just how many sins she had committed in her lifetime. As Raosa walked into the city, she saw the other heroes who tried to intercept the siblings, who seemed to be alive at the least. That's when the siblings changed positions with them, and Miel asked what an outsider was doing here, and for what purpose she had come here. Raosa introduced herself as a hero, and said that she wanted to bring them back, which immediately made Mael summon a bunch of demons, and tell Raosa to go back, as if she does not, she will end up in hell. Ryosa agreed to go back, but she wanted them to come with her so that they could go back together. The siblings tried their best against her, but they couldn't hope to stand against her might. She told them that they are kind children, as she doesn't feel any killing intent from their attacks, which saddened her even more. If the heroes that came for them before were actually good people, the situation wouldn't have escalated so much. It's also strange that even though they think they are doing the right thing, people are getting in their way again and again. The siblings were afraid as she approached, but she promised not to hurt them. However, what they were doing wasn't right, and their old teacher is very sad because of it. Miel didn't believe her at first, as Mago would have come for them by now, but Raosa swore she was not lying, and urged them to release their abilities and come back, as they would all go back to their teacher. At that moment, both Miel and Maele felt a motherly warmth for her, and so they went. When they finally met up with Mago, Miel told him everything, about how they were actually special types, they only kept it hidden because their mother told them to. They knew that he only took summoners in as apprentices, so they apologized for lying. Mago was shocked and asked who told them such a thing. They explained it was Chitu, a hero who was her apprentice before. Mago told them that he never took her in as an apprentice. He only met her once and gave her a single piece of advice, nothing more. Being reunited after three long years, they all shared what happened over those years, with the siblings sharing how they worked to grow into better people and about how other people didn't understand them at all. To this day, Miel and Mael still don't get why people were so mean to them. 
Ryosa asked if he was finished with them, but Mago asked if she could entrust the both of them to him. Even though they did not kill anyone, they still had thousands of hostages, and even killed a hero, so the death penalty would be hard to avoid. They are young children, who strayed on the wrong path due to their being alone. He would take full responsibility for their actions until now. Ryosa couldn't do something like that, as even if she didn't agree with Yudoridi's law, to execute non-adults if they commit crimes, the law is the law. Additionally, the job of a hero isn't rehabilitation, but when she met these two, she felt what he felt. There are many issues with the current world. So she asked Mago to work with her from now on, as she swore to change the world no matter what happens. Mago became mesmerized with the will in Raosa's eyes, and had a condition for this. These kids shouldn't die until they are adults, so he would like to use his ability on them one last time. Raosa agreed, and so Mago cast his most powerful protection spell on them. This is why they were protected against Gangyu's attacks, who now remembers one of the first times he met Raosa, and she said the exact same thing to him. As he gets up, Miel notes that they simply judged people based on their rule. Isn't the law the same? Rules made by people? What is the difference between them if that's the case? Hong also tries to convince Gang Yu that they can rehabilitate these two. But Gang Yu shuts her up by putting her in the bubble and slowly walks in while charging up his fist with power. Miel tries to reason with him, saying that they are wrong and that they won't do it again. But when Gang Yu shows no sign of stopping, they can only cry out for their mother and their teacher, who has done all that he could for them. The entire prison rumbles as the attack lands, but it goes into the ground, as Gang Yu doesn't know what to do. A thousand thoughts rush through his head all at once. Fortunately for him, he didn't have to think for long, as Sinka comes from behind and cuts them into tiny little pieces as she enters the room through a portal. She tells Gang Yu that he doesn't have to make such a sad face, thinking so much does not suit him at all. Now that she sees him, he is much more handsome in person. She really made the right decision in picking him as her husband. Before Sinka can say anything else, Gong Yu goes for a punch, which is stopped by Canis, who is mad that he isn't listening quietly like he's supposed to. Sinka tells him that he shouldn't be rude, as that person will become his new master soon. Canis apologizes for his mistake, and Sinka tries to introduce herself once again, but Gang Yu starts attacking her once again, forcing her to make a barrier. He is quite the impatient one, but since they will be seeing each other for a while, they should chat a little. As he heard, her name is Sinka, and she will be the woman who will become the new Eve of mankind. Gang Yu wonders what she's even talking about, but if he's honest, he's just tired at this point. A crazy bastard just appeared right in front of him, and he doesn't know what to do. Sinka notes that she's probably the sanest person on the whole planet, which the others agree with. She notes that mankind is in a precarious situation right now, as it's slowly degenerating as they speak. If they keep going like this, they will eventually go extinct. Gang Yu asks what she's saying, but she responds with a question. What does he think is the biggest threat to humanity right now? He belonged to equality in the past so he probably thinks that it would be the villains or the heroes of the past that held absolute authority over anything. However, both of these are wrong. What is eating away at the belly of mankind is those without any ability who live normal lives. Their genes must be culled. Only people who possess superior genes should be birthing new generations. But due to the sacrifice given by those with the superior genes, the genes that were supposed to be culled have multiplied tenfold, like rats in a sewer. For example, the second generation equality heroes led by Ryosa. They possess incredible abilities, yet why did they die, even though the logic of nature stated otherwise? It's natural for those who are not selected by evolution to disappear, but they tried to stop that. If he was wondering, he's safe from all of this, as he is no longer a hero. Right now he's probably enjoying killing off weaker people, right? She fell in deep love when she saw him in action. He should know though, this person is a gathering spot for superior humans that will become the new mankind that were unfairly imprisoned for culling the weak. After they get rid of these so-called heroes that want to stop them, and every inferior human together, they will build a world where only the strong exist, the alpha world. She's generous too, as if the heroes change their minds and join them, they will allow them to live. They aren't that strict. Gang Yu notes that he doesn't try to kill anyone who's a criminal, but it seems like killing is inevitable at this point. Sinka notes that he shouldn't say something so embarrassing, with her minions telling her that he isn't saying what she thinks he's saying. Sinka understands, but they should do that somewhere else. When they are alone, she will get back to her explanation now, as she was cut off. He is Adam, and she is Eve. Together, they will make children that will lead the new evolution of mankind. At first she went to Juan to see if he's compatible as an Adam, and even used an EMP attack to save him. However, the security of this place is much stronger than she previously thought, as no external attacks made a dent. This is why, after they got their hands on the internal floor plan, they used a custom EMP and blasted it from within by using her ability. After that, 
She talked with Juan, but he is underaged and hasn't gone through puberty, and since an ability completes only when one is an adult, he needs more time. However, since time is precious and she won't give up, she has devised an amazing plan. Before Juan becomes an adult, she will work with him, and once he does, they will all work together for mankind. She found a genius solution to pass on the superior genes that belong to the both of them, and the family won't be related by blood at all. She asks Gong Yu if he understands, but the only thing he's fixated on is that they used an EMP attack, the same one that killed his brother. Sinka wonders why she's curious, but remembers that his older brother was a prison inspector there, so he died after the EMP attack with the others. It's fine though, as he can just make a new family with her. She asks if he's made a decision, but Gong Yu decided a while ago. He takes back what he said about killing being inevitable. He promises to make her death as painful as possible, by ripping her skin off and breaking her bones into tiny fragments. Sinka can't believe that he would want to rip her apart, but if she's honest, a lover's quarrel doesn't sound bad, as that's how relationships become stronger. Sinka can't believe how energetic he is already, but still has to block one of his attacks from hitting her. This makes Gang Yu back away, allowing her to close the portal and say that they should do all of this outside, after he cools his pretty little head a bit. Gang Yu refuses to let her go, so he charges all of his power and jumps right in front of her, before striking once again, and again. Sinka believes this is like a game, so she tells him to come and catch her already. Gang Yu does not care for her little games, but will certainly do as she wishes, and crush her skull in. He activates Mode 1, allowing him to move at insane speeds and almost catch Sinka, who moves out of the way and tells him to wait. But Gang Yu is long past waiting, and charges in again and again, until finally he is stopped by Gato, who holds him in place. Sinka believes that things were going swell. She had no place to intervene, but Gato tells her that she would have died. Before she can finish her sentence fully, Gang Yu grabs Gato and smashes her with full force into the ground, leaving only a pool of red blood. Surprisingly, Gato appears behind Sinka and says that if that guy would have gotten to her, she would have died. Now, what is she going to do for the life that she just lost for her? Sinka eventually relents and says that it's a pity to lose such precious genes. Why did he not sit still and accept the world for what it is? Gang Yu activates Mode 5, but Sinka is done sitting around so she uses multiple dimensions to let everyone out. He should say hello to everyone, as they are the new mankind, and they will be in charge from this day forth. From B3, a Swede, summoner type, who can't believe that Mago didn't die by his hands. Ho, physical type, who wonders if he will be able to tame her. Friatua, physical type, who asks if he's even needed around here. Natura, special type, tells him that everyone is needed in this new world. Pekenyu, special type, only thinks about how scared she is. Vidi, special type, feels truly inspired by the scene in front of him. Mores, special type, tells him off for smoking in a public area. Xing Shi, physical type, only says her name. And Tiburon, physical type, tells him to shut up already. Hyun Jo Young, special type, notes that there are only demons gathered in this hell. How fitting. B4 criminals. Tatsu Jin, special slash physical type, who notices that her sheath is empty. Stiffness, physical type, notes that only useless bastards have to rely on weapons to fight. Terrapier, physical type, can't believe that number four is still alive after all. Maledity, summoner slash special type, says that her clothes are pretty comfortable. Hero, special type, who does not say much of anything. And finally, the last B5 criminals, Ahora, special type, and Huang, special type, who is glad to finally see Gang Yu. Gang Yu is consumed by his own rage and thirst for revenge, so he activates his most powerful mode, Mode Zero. With that, he charges into Huang, attempting to take him down first. Thank you for watching. See you next time.